In Laodicea, this was a uh, Roman theater. Uh, this kind of thing was common uh, throughout the whole empire. Okay, so here we are on uh, beginning Laodicea. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, right? These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Anybody know what the word Amen means or Amen? So be it. So be it. Or basically... When we end our prayers, we say, we say amen, right? And in other words, this is the end. This is, you know, I'm finished, right? And this is what he said. These things saith the amen. In other words, it ends with me, right? These things saith the amen. And, and Jesus is speaking and he says, he is the faithful and the true witness. And notice it's the beginning of the creation of God. Now that does not, if you read that improperly, you might get the idea that Jesus was the first one that God created. But that's not, it. That's not what it means. Okay, so he's the beginning of the creation of God. In other words, he is the creator. Yes. Right? If Jesus is the beginning of the creation of God, he is the creator. In other words, nothing was made before Jesus and really, if you want a true picture of creation, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Jesus was standing right next to God. There's two persons, right? And there's three, actually three, the Holy Spirit. And so you have Jesus, and there was nobody else created. And so he is the beginning of the creation of God. He creates the whole entire creation. Nothing was that exists existed before him or outside of him. Okay, we're talking about Laodicea. Well, this actually was originally the city Laodicea was originally called Diospolis. Diospolis at D I O S P O L I S, which literally is interpreted city of Zeus. Okay, well, we've seen Zeus come in and emerge before, right? When we were talking about Pergamum, remember, we saw the altar, and we said that that was an altar made to Zeus. Well, at this last church, it was, the name was liter, literally called the city of Zeus, the gods, the primary gods that were worshipped. Now, when we say the gods that were worshipped, obviously there were more than these Gods, these so-called gods, are the, the the primary gods that were worshipped. There was a lot of gods that were worshipped in these in these towns, right? But the primary god was first Zeus. Zeus was what? He was he was the same as Jupiter. He was he was Zeus to the the, the Greeks, Jupiter to the Romans. He was the god of gods to them, right? He was the main one. This this and uh, if you go to the next slide, you'll actually see uh, Zeus here. You see him, he holds the thunderbolt, okay? Sometimes you, you'll see him pictured in mytholo mythology books. He would throw, how many have seen Thor? The hammer of Thor, right? Basically, it's the same idea, okay? Um, but Zeus would toss that thunderbolt. And then the next uh, primary god that was worshipped here in Laodicea is a Ascapolis. Let's see that one. And this should seem familiar to you. <clears throat> when you go, how many have ever been to the doctor's office or hospital? How many have looked at the little thing that they wear on their, the, you know, the little badge that they wear, and it, it happens to be a stick with a serpent come up it, coming up. And, you know, it's like, I don't know if that aggravates you, but it does me. I don't like being reminded when I go to the doctor that here, you know, they, that their uh, symbol is a, a uh, pole with a snake climbing up it. And actually, that was the sign of Asclepolis. And you get, these are both images of him. And you can see the serpent with the pole. And uh, Asclep the reason they adopted that is because this God was known for the great miraculous healings that were done in his name and at his temples. Laodicea 
was one of the major places. In fact, there's four things uh, about uh, Laodicea historically. That, um, number one, historically there was great progress in medicine more than any other place in the world. And that's why this Escapolis was worshipped because there was such great progress in medicine. Number two, they actually pioneered the field of ophthalmology. Nowhere else in the world did they do anything about the eyes, but here in Laodicea, it's like they invented this whole field of ophthalmology. Uh, three, they were world-renowned for their glossy black wool. People would pay a tremendous amount of money for this glossy black wool that they could, they could only get there in Laodicea. And number four, it was the richest commercial center of the world. Okay? And you'll see that come out with Jesus talking. So you got Zeus, you got Scepolis, and then you got uh, one of our favorites, Apollo. And you can see Apollo here. There's, uh, there's two things that stand out, Apollo. <clears throat> one was the bow. And the other, he, you see him playing music. Now, I don't know how much you know about Lucifer, but... You know, I listen to a lot of preachers down through, uh, through history. And one of the things that they uh, often teach about, because they get it out of Ezekiel, that Lucifer seemed to have been connected with leading the worship and music. And it's, it's, I, don't, I think it's a small coincidence that there's, it seems like no matter what generation you look at, it seems like Satan infects the music of that generation. Absolutely. And I, w- I mean, I, honestly, when I look at stuff that's out there today, it just freaks me out mm-hmm. how satanic some of this stuff is. And I know we had our own satanic stuff, and John still has some of it. I don't know why he still has some of it. Get rid of it, though. <clears throat> You know, we had one group, I don't remember, they, they, they sang the song, I'm on the highway to hell. Remember that? And then like a week later, or some a year later, the drummer dies and goes to hell. You know, it's like, whoa, he got what he wanted, right? But anyway, I'm, I'm getting diverted. But anyway, we, we talked about Apollo. I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on these gods, but um, uh, I want you to notice the bow. Because the bow is a significant symbol of Apollo. We see that he rises in the ninth chapter of Revelation. And the interesting thing is, in the book of Revelation, you actually have a rider coming on a white horse holding a bow. And just about every commentator throughout all these years of Christianity... Anyone who's even attempted to write a commentary on the book of Revelation, everybody knows what a commentary is? It's a book that explains the verses of Scripture. And there's a great variety but, uh, of meaning, but almost, almost 100%, and it's not 100%, but almost 100% of them will say the rider on the white horse is the entrance of the Antichrist. So you see the parallel we have We've talked a lot about Apollo coming, rising up from the ninth chapter of Revelation, going into Antichrist. Well, here he is represented with the bow, and here he is, um, this white horse, which uh, actually he's, uh, he's loosed in Revelation chapter 6, verse 1. And he's not only loosed uh, one of them, but there's actually four. How many have heard of the four horsemen of the apocalypse? Some people try to say that the rider on the white horse with the bow is actually Jesus. That's wrong. And the only reason they make that uh, association, because in the Revelation chapter 19, Jesus does come riding on a white horse. And he's got a sword in his mouth, a crown on his head. But it says nothing about a bow. And they assume that because you have the rider on the white horse here and the rider on the white horse here, it must be the same. But let me remind you of of one of my favorite teachings. I don't know if it came out of the book of Ron, but um, one of my favorite teachings is this, to get your attention. Satan is a counterfeiter. Right? So 
why, why wouldn't he come riding on a white horse if that's the way Jesus is going to come? Don't be uh, amazed at the deception that is, is, is going to come on the increase today. Uh, things that are going to be happening as we go further and further, counterfeiting the, uh, the um, miracles in the Bible and um, the teachings in the Bible. The, um, you had the false gods, right, that were worshipped. But the other thing that you had, and especially in Laodicea, were the emperors. All of the Roman emperors were considered to be gods. And every Roman emperor that, that the new Roman emperor would, would make sure that the other Roman emperors were worshipped as gods. This is one of the th- reasons Christianity had so much trouble in the Roman Empire. They would not bow down and worship the Roman gods. Uh, let's go to the next slide because there's more, see? <laughs> there's more of them. Okay, uh, let's go to the next slide. And actually, now we, got, uh, we have this uh, slide not, uh, marked up here. When, when you read Revelation chapter 13, this is a description. Now, I put this goofy thing together. That's why it looks so ugly, because I am not an artiste. But what I did is I took a lion's head, and uh, I clipped it on, you know, this, this uh, um, animal's uh, uh, neck there. I, I actually used the neck of a giraffe, which is because I didn't know what to use to get all those heads in there. But anyway, the beast had seven heads, right? He had a head like a lion. He said they had a head like a bear. He had a head like a leopard, right? And then he also had a, a body like a leopard. He had feet like a bear. He also had ten horns upon his head. <clears throat> When John was speaking during his time, when he was first telling us about this beast, you're going to notice that he said that, he said there were seven heads. He said six have already come. There was one yet to come. So one of those heads had to be the emperor that was during his day. And the other, there's five others that had to have preceded that emperor, and then there was one yet to come. And uh, so I've labeled those. Now, I don't know if Domitian was at the head of the bear. I just, you know, kind of randomly did that. And, uh, but you can, actually, this is probably more what the, uh, you, you see a lot of pictures of what, what the, this beast looked like. But this actually merges the book of Daniel together with the book of Revelation in this picture. John saw the, saw be- the same beast as Daniel did. Oh, okay, so, so we have uh, Jesus saying to this Laodicean church, he says, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou were cold or hot. I drink coffee. Coffee. You have to say like coffee. Okay. But I, I drink coffee. But I drink hot coffee. It, intelligent people drink hot coffee. Goofy people drink iced coffee. Because iced coffee was not meant to be ice. That's right. And, and the way I can prove that is as soon as you're coffee is no longer hot, most people say, ew, and they throw it down the sink. But some people think, you know what, I'll, now that it's ew, instead of throwing it away, I'll put ice in it. In fact, I'll go to Starbucks, and instead of, of getting coffee, they'll put ice in it, and they'll pay $5 for coffee you should throw out. So I don't, I, don't, I don't get the whole thing, right? The whole point is, he, what he's talking about, look, this church, he's saying, he said, you're not cold or hot. And you can, you can look at that illustration with, with this whole cold coffee and hot coffee. Some people like it cold, some people like it hot. But I haven't found anybody that says, make mine 
lukewarm. <laughs> Remember the movie we saw where she, uh, what was it called? Oh, yeah, where she, room. she gave, yeah, the war room, and she gave her a cup of coffee. Oh, and she was asking her if she was hot or, or cold Christian, and she said she was kind of in the middle. And so she sat down, she gave her a cup of coffee, and she's like, Ooh! <laughs> she said, oh, you like your coffee hot? <laughs> she says, well, so does the Lord. <laughs> but that was pretty cool. But anyway, Jesus is saying, if that's your Christianity, you're supposed to be hot. There should not be one Christian on this earth who's not hot about God, hot, filled with the Holy Ghost, who is not doing everything within their power. When I say within their power, obviously we don't walk within our power. We walk within our power the best we can, and that being influenced and helped by the Holy Spirit in us, right? We're supposed to, uh, to give our whole life to God, but God says, I would like you to be hot like you're supposed to be, or else totally cold. Yeah. Totally cold because I can get your attention when you're totally cold. You're looking at somebody right here that was so lost, so lost, I can't even begin to tell you things that I did. I'm so ashamed. If it wasn't for the grace of the gospel of Jesus Christ. See, this is what, these are the things he's, he's, he's saying, I'd rather have you hot, but then, I, I, you, so, you know, if you're cold, at least I can work with you. But when you're lukewarm, what that is, is people that go to church. He's talking about people that go to, they're in, actually talking to the church. He said, you got people in this church. He said, if, if you're cold, I can get to you. And if you're hot, that's where you're supposed to be. But if you're lukewarm, you think you're okay. Tons and tons, most people in Christianity today, they think they're okay. And they're not. Right. If you're not hot, you're in the wrong place. You need to change. And, and we'll see this message here. Now remember the, the, last met, the last church, he was talking about the rapture and everything. He's saying, because you keep my word, because, he, he's like, because you are like the best Christians... I'm going to help. I'm going to uh, let you escape. I've, I've set before you an open door, and you won't even come into the temptation that that uh, uh, occurs uh, and is con- uh, that the whole world is confronted with. You escape. So, but to this church, this church, the door is shut. We'll see um, because they're lukewarm. <laughs> so then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot. I will spit you out of my mouth. Now, how would you like your praying? How many pray in a closet? They bring that out in the war room too, right? Jesus said, go in your closet and pray. The woman made a place. She took all her clothes out of the closet. She turned her closet into a prayer room. Yeah. That, was a pre- that was pretty cool. She had all her prayer requests on the walls, you know, taped on the walls, and it was actually a good idea, and that's kind of what Jesus was saying. But how would you like to go into your prayer room, whatever that is, and, uh, and, and Jesus says this to you, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. I don't want him to say that to me. And yet, if, I, if I'm lukewarm... That's what he's saying. I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. And what we find in this in this seventh church, which is the last church, is he's saying, I'm going to I'm going to spit you right into the tribulation, is what he's saying. So we'll see that in a couple minutes here. Because thou sayest, now remember Laodicea is the, this richest center, a commercial center in the world. And because you say I am rich. I am increased with goods, have need of nothing. How many have known people that they, they are so wealthy, they have so much going for them, they don't need God? You know who truly is, seems to be blessed are people that know they need God. 
And sometimes God will get your attention because you have all the, these things going for you and you'll end up in a situation that you have to cry out to God. Because there's certain things, no matter how much money you have, there's certain things you can't buy with money. And one of those things is your health. You see people, they live their life, they, they don't pay attention to God at all because they have everything. You know, maybe Wall Street made them totally wealthy. But in their end day, they're, you know, luckily some of them are crying out to God. God have mercy upon my soul. God is so good, he does. But there's that lukewarm people. They don't know they're outside of the will of God. They don't even know when they're being chastised that it's God trying to get their attention. It just generalizes to any church. But I think it's primarily teaching to the church because... You have to understand that the world out there, this, this Bible, this Bible is not written to the world. I don't know if you've ever understood that. This Bible is written to God's children. This really, that, that's why a lot of people, when you know, if you'll believe this, if you walk and you believe this, they'll tell you that that's superstitious, that you can't. You can't trust the book like that. They'll try to reason with you and to, uh, try, to try to knock your faith from one end to the other saying you can't trust this. But a child of God knows he can. A child of God gets in and draws close to God and after a time he realizes, or she, he or she, realizes that I'm going to put the word of God first in everything that I do. You know, here's the thing. How do you know? We talked about Christopher Columbus on Sunday morning. How do you know there was really a Christopher Columbus? Were you there? Who, who was there? 1492. You only know what some teacher told you. Right? I've heard people say, well, how could you believe the book? Because God told me. Um, we have no trouble believing in Moses. A lot of people will say they believe that there was a Moses. Some say it wasn't really, it was like a composite of all these people. Oh my goodness, they need to get saved. You don't know if there was really an Abraham Lincoln. You don't know if there was a George Washington and whether he really did have wooden teeth. You don't know. You don't know how electricity works. Now, somebody, John, he may know, or, or maybe, maybe he knows enough to get electrocuted. I don't know. But here's what I know about electricity. Don't fool around with it. Just turn the switch on or off. That's all I need to know. He says, uh, he says then, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire. What do you think he's talking about? Gold tried in in the fire. Last week we talk, he talked to a different church and he was, he was um, commending them on something that they were doing that just was outstanding. And he said, because you have done this, I'm going to keep you from the hour of temptation that comes upon the early earth. To me, when I read that, this is the goal that was tried in the fire. This is the goal. Who was tried in the fire? The martyrs were tried in the fire, right? What gave them the hope? What gave them the strength? What gave them the courage to stand up and not deny Christ? Faith, which comes from the Word. Faith cometh by hearing, right? And hearing by the word of God. So he says, I counsel thee to buy uh, of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich. In other words, they, we just read, they say they are rich. But they don't have the true riches. The true riches are not what you get in this world. You can have the money of Donald Trump and that doesn't mean anything. The only thing that that means is if you, if God has blessed you with that kind of money, you can do a lot of good things in his name. 
with that money. But just to have that money, it's not going to buy you out of the tribulation. It even says in the Bible that in the last days, rich men are going to throw their gold and silver into the streets. It's going to be worthless. It's not going to buy them out. You know, people tell you, here's, here's the thing that you can do to avoid the, the, the great uh, judgment that's coming. Take everything you have and put it in gold and silver. Try eating that sometime. You try eating it, yeah, that's right. You know what, I would, I would rather not have the gold and silver and have faith in God and to be able to pray and say, Lord, you fed several million Israelites when they were in the wilderness with manna from heaven. I believe you're going to feed me and my family. I'm going to, I believe we're going to feed this church. He showed us over and over. A little boy brought a lunch and he fed it says 5,000, right? But that was only men. That was only men. Uh, yeah, assuming they had wives, there's 10,000. And then if they had children, there's more, right? It could have been 25,000 people. And then when they were all done, they collected 12 full baskets. Which, this is wonderful if you see the movie, right? Anyone in, in most, most of the movies about Jesus have this, this picture because it's so wonderful. And here they come with these baskets of bread and fish. Yeah. And they're celebrating. And, and it all came from this little lunch. He fed all these people and they had all that left over. Tremendous. But he says, he says, uh, counsel me to buy gold, try on the fire that you may be rich. And white raiment, what were they known for? This city was known for their glossy black wool. And Jesus is talking about white raiment. He said, that glossy black wool you're so proud of, that's nothing. You need white raiment from me. And, and, and I think it was last week or, or earlier, I talked about the wedding garment. If you can remember, we went through the wedding garment, not having the wedding garment. I think it was last week. You, without the wedding garment, you're not getting in. And without the white raiment, you're not going. Praise God. <clears throat> and and, and that sh the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. There's an allusion to Adam and Eve in the garden, right? They knew that they were naked. And they tried to cover up their own nakedness. Do you remember? They tried to cover it up. You know what? You can't cover your nakedness. Which is your shame. You can't cover it up yourself. What did God do? He slew an animal and covered him with skins. Right? There had to be the death of an animal. A sacrifice had to, to be done to, to truly cover them up. And that sacrifice is Christ. And that's what we need. So uh, you need uh, and uh, to take that to cover up your uh, shame that your nakedness does not appear, and anoint thy eyes with eye salve. What else was Laodicea known for? Ophthalmology, which is medicine or, or the study of the eyes. Okay, in fact, ophthalmology, the word means study of the eyes. And here he says, hey, you know what? All that stuff you're, you think that you got going on, the, on, on your eyes, you need eye salve that you may see. He's saying, you think you see, but you are blind. Now remember, in context, he's talking to the lukewarm people in the church. Not outside. He's not, anytime when you're reading the book, he is talking to his people. Now I know that because in Ephesians, it, it says if you do not have God... If you are not in the covenant, you are, as far as God's concerned, you are a not. He calls you a not. Well, we get the word not head. Yeah, you're a not head. <laughs> not, n not a snot. <laughs> but I thought I liked that. A not head. You are a not. In other words, you, you don't even, in God's, you don't even register. As far as God's covenant goes, you are, and it goes on to say, he said, not only are you not, he says, you have 
no hope and you are without God in this world. In other words, if you don't come into my covenant, I can't help you. We wonder why, as Christian, we wonder why doesn't God, why, why does God let us go through this? And, and I think sometimes maybe we should get the idea, did we pray about it? God doesn't, you know, I, I hear people say, well, God, go, God owns all the cattle on the hill. Well, that's true and not true. He did own it all, but he gave it to Adam. And Adam took it and lost it to Satan. And Satan became the God of this world. And Jesus came to get everything back. And yes, he did succeed. And yes, truly, Jesus did beat Satan. And he does own everything, but he's up there. That's right. That's right. And Satan is still ruling until he comes and puts Satan in his place. That's right. The Bible says he'll crush his head, he'll throw him into prison, right? But he hasn't done that yet. And in fact, he told us, we're kind of like a peacekeeping force. He basically told us as the church to, to, to you go out and you do some peacekeeping, you do my mission until I come to complete it on the earth. Yeah, he, he completed your salvation, but you know what? Our bodies haven't been delivered yet. Our spirits have been born again, but our body, our souls haven't been taken care of yet. That's all going to happen when he comes to get us. And Jesus isn't even talking about the world here. He's talking to the church. Look at this. Look at what he says then. As many as I love, I rebuke. And chasten, or chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. I th- you know, we, we have so much grace teaching yeah. Yeah. that sometimes I think it's time to hear a little repent. Yeah. You know, because it's, it's to these seven churches yeah. that God says repent. In fact, you will, you'll discover if that book is your covenant, it's written to you as child of God, Go get a concordance and see how many times it says repent. And then wonder, you know, did, do you think God gave up on repentance? I don't think so. I don't think this is the final of the seventh church, the churches. And he's still saying repent. In fact, this one's the worst of the bunch. Look, look at the next one here. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Now, remember last time, the door was open. The last church, the door was open. And Jesus said, Behold, I I set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. But to this church, he said, Hey, (laughs) the door is shut. Do you not understand the door is shut? He's talking to the church. He's talking to the the not not the hot ones and the cold ones are not really in the family of God right he's talking to the lukewarm members of the church and he's saying to them he said i'm standing at the door and knocking if any actually the greek has that idea that he he's continuing to knock it's not like he knocks once and then walks away. Oh, well, good. I, I didn't want to talk to him anyway. Do you, ever, do you ever go to somebody's house like that? Especially, you know, when you're a kid and you did something wrong and, you're, and your parents say you have to go say, yeah, you know, you know, so, but that's not Jesus. Jesus keeps, he's, even though they've turned their back on him, he's, he's knocking. And he says, if any man hears my voice, what's hearing the voice? Listening to the word where's the word I have run into so many people that that you know they say well if if I would hear from God then I would know there was a what do you mean hear from God he gave you 66 books this is God's word why would God speak to you individually if you're not going to pay attention to what he wrote in his book everybody wants a vision Read the book, you'll get your vision. And God speaks to me in many different ways, and he said he would, but you've got to show him that you care, right? 
Anyway, he says, if any man hears my voice and opens the door, notice who's in, who's in control of the door now. Before Jesus, he said, I set before you an open door. Those are the people that are going in the rapture he's talking to. In the Philadelphia church, in this church, he's saying, you need to open the door. You need to take the responsibility, open the door. And if you do, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. You know what he's saying? I will come and have a, a meal. Actually, it is, we've talked about blood covenant in the past. It's a blood covenant meal. He wants to come in and have communion. Remember, he's the high priest. He's, bang, he's knocking on the door saying, I've got wine. Or, you know, if you, if you believe in unleaded, I have grape juice. And I have bread. Bread and wine, right? It could be leaded or unleaded. And if anyone will open up the door, I'll have this communion. I want to have communion with you. How many have shut him out? This comes from the Old Testament. And, and this scripture, when I saw it, now I've never, I have, honestly, I have never really made this connection until this class. Remember, I've told you in the past, I have seen much, much revelation just as we're going through the class. And this comes from Deuteronomy. Just because we're not under the law, to do the works of the law doesn't mean we, don't, we throw the law away, right? Deuteronomy the, is the uh, fifth book in the, uh, in the Old Testament, chapter 4, verse 30. Listen to this. It says, when you art in tribulation. Tribulation is a word which means the testing, right? You're going through the... But we call the great tribulation the thing that comes in the last day. So somebody could say right away, they could say, well, you know, he's not talking about the great tribulation. He's talking about any type of testing. Well, that even makes the scripture better. Because he's saying, it, when you, whenever you're being tested. But watch this. He said, when you are in the tribulation, or in tribulation, and all these things have come upon you, even in the... Even in the latter days. Even in the latter days. What's the latter days? Now. That's right. Or if, you're, if you miss the rapture, even then. That's the latter days, right? That, that's the last days. Latter day last. He said, so when you find yourself in the tribulation... Or any testing. And all these things, all these terrible... And, and if you read, Deuteronomy, all these terrible things have happened to you, even in the latter days, if, still, if you turn to the Lord your God and shall be obedient unto His word. It says voice, but His voice is the word, right? For the Lord thy God is a merciful God, my, you know, you ever see a dog and his ears pop? You know, his just his ears come straight up. That's kind of what happened to me when I when I ran across the scripture. My, it's like my ears came up. God is. It was saying. He said, even if you will find yourself in the great tribulation in the latter days, he said he will not forsake thee. You know, you see that movie, Left Behind? What he's saying, even if you're left behind, to me, may, you know, maybe I'm wrong. Don't, don't take this as gospel. I, I can't prove this. This is more gospel of Ron, or book of Ron stuff. But I, what I'm seeing in there is a promise that even if you, you threw it away, I mean, you have a promise of going in the rapture. Did you know that uh, Jacob had a promise? And his brother Esau had a promise. And actually, Esau was the firstborn. So he had the right of firstborn. And Jacob wanted it. Because he knew that that blessing was valuable because God was behind it. 
right? So Esau thought so little about his privileged position that he sold it for a pot of stew. Or not even a pot, a bowl. A bowl. He didn't even get the whole pot. At least when Laura makes me soup, I have some left after I had a bowl. He threw it all away for a bowl of soup or stew. Even Laura's stew is not that good. To throw away heaven? Pastor, what sin is that is worth that? Throw away heaven. I don't think any. Laura, what, what, what's, what's sin? John, what, what's sin? Um, what's better than going to heaven? I guess I'd have to let go of the music. <laughs> well, we'll let you deal with that. Sarah, what, what sin's better than going to is this, I mean, is that crazy? Esau, you see what Esau did? Why would we have the promise and let the promise go? To the point where now Jesus is on the outside knocking on the door. And when I read, when I read that Revelation story and Jesus is on the outside... It come, it dawns on me, and I'm not that sharp, you know, sometimes it takes longer than the rest of you. But when I see that in my mind, and he's outside knocking on, I don't think those people saw him, the door close. I don't think that they realized, remember, they're lukewarm. They didn't know that the glory of God had left them. This comforts me that even if for some stupidity that I was left behind because I mean because I sold something for a bowl of stew he said if you'll turn if, you, if you'll be obe- if you'll turn back to the Lord if thou turn to the Lord thy God and shall be obedient to his voice before the Lord thy God is merciful he will not forsake thee neither destroy thee nor Forget the covenant. Oh my goodness. You mean if I'm left behind, I still have a covenant with God? You mean I can still return to God? Now, I'm going to warn you, nine, nine preachers out of ten will tell you, nope, you don't get a second chance. I'll, I'll warn you right now. They'll say, you know, you don't get a second chance. It's not a second chance. As long as I'm alive, it's still the same chance. God, what he's saying, I won't give up. I love you so much. I sent my son. The best thing I could do, the most holy, the most valuable thing I could give. And I will still stand here. Let me put it this way. How many have somebody and can can think of somebody in their mind that they would stand, no matter what, they would stand and stand and stand and stand and stand because you love them. You're not going to let go. Even though they afflict you, even though they, they've done things wrong to you, and you just you won't let go because of love. The love you have is nothing like the love Jesus has for you. In fact, if you got any love, it came from Him. If you, look, if you read in Galatians, it talks about the fruit of the Spirit, not the gifts of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, and one of them is love. And love has to grow in your new spirit. You have to let it grow, and it's up to you. It's up to you how well it grows. He won't forget the covenant of your fathers, which He swore unto them. You say, oh, well, that's the Old Testament. Now, wait a minute. The New Testament, once again, in Galatians and uh, in, uh, in Romans, both tells us that we are, if we are in Christ, we are Abram's seed, an heir according to the promise, right? When did he make the, the promise to Abram? It was in the Old Testament. In fact, he, before the law, he made the promise to Abram. 
The Apostle Paul even argues that you can't take the law and, re- and, and, and cancel out the promise and the covenant, right? That's how much God loves us. I know, I know that the rapture happens pre-tribulation rapture. Some people say, well, I don't know. You know, it could be pre-trib, it could be mid-trib, it could be post-trib. Yeah, maybe there's no rapture. I know. I know the Lord comes before the tribulation. It's just a revelation. I, I, I know. Scripture. It's true. Yes. But the other thing is I believe, I am, I am absolute. in fact, I know, once again, that three and a half years after he picked up the church, he's coming back for Enoch and Elijah. Some say Moses and Elijah, and I'll give you it. It could be. I still think it's Enoch and Elijah. You know, the two witnesses. It says right there in chapter 11, Revelation, that they will be killed by the Antichrist. They will rise and they will ascend into heaven. There will be a sound of a trumpet. And I I have said that somehow the 144,000 first fruits of Israel were on the earth. They talk about the two witnesses and then all of a sudden you see them in heaven. When did they go up? They went up. It has to be they went up when Enoch and Elijah did. In other words, they went up in a rapture. In other words, there must be two. There must be the rapture, the first fruits of the church, and then there's the first fruits of Israel goes up in a rapture too. So I have, I have made the, the, uh, the statement, if you miss the first train, go on the second one. To me, it's very simple. I know there's two raptures. I didn't have this scripture. I just knew it was true. But but now now I have a promise. He said, if you even if this happens in the latter days, you find yourself in tribulation and you turn back to me, he said, I won't forsake you, and I will not forget the covenant. I believe God's saying, I I will open, if you will open that door, look what he says to these guys. If you can't make it now, why would you think you're going to make it then? But I'm trying to encourage you that God's mercy endures forever. Now, look, he said all this to this church, right? The Laodicea, and look what he says now. To him that overcomes... Now, he said, this church is outside. The door is shut. This is not the church that has the promise of the rapture. But then he turns around and he tells them... You know, he said, if you open the door, he'll come in. He said, to him that overcomes, will I grant to sit with me in my throne. Even as I also overcame and am sat down or set down with my father in his throne I don't care if you have to lose your head because of it or if you know if if, if God grace opens up and you can be caught up with 144 I don't know if that that can happen or not I'm just saying why not but it you know Jesus says this according to your faith be it unto you right He said, ask and you shall receive that your joy may be full. And this is still the same covenant. So I'm just saying, take that with a grain of salt. You can only overcome the enemy of your soul by the word and the spirit of Almighty God. I don't care how tough you are, you're no match against Satan. You, you just, I mean, people, for some reason, wow, the ignorance is so great. They don't understand that Satan is or was the most brilliant being that God ever made. He, was, he had all this great magic. He turned, he led the rebellion of a third of the angels in heaven 
And we think we're going to outsmart him? He's been around, you know, if the Bible's true, and I believe it is, man's only been here for about 6,000 years. But Satan was there from the beginning, from the first man, first woman. Do you think you're so special that he doesn't have you figured out? He has had, just, just alive right now on the earth, there's, there's what, over seven, seven some point something billion people. So there's seven point something billion just like you walking around. We're not that special in the flesh, right? The only thing that makes us special is we're the children of God. You think you're going to outsmart Satan? You're not going to outsmart him. You need the Holy Spirit. You need the Word. That's the only way you're going to beat God or, or beat Satan. But he said if you, if you, if you will overcome, you will, he will grant you to sit in the throne. Now, he was talking to he, the, the hot people. He's not really so much talking to because they're hot. He's talking to the cold people to turn, and he's talking to the lukewarm to come back. And even if you're in that state, even if you're so far away from God for one reason or another, he's saying you can return. He said, even as I also overcame and sat down with my father in his throne. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. How many have heard him say that before? Many times. See, I am so blessed because I have an ear. And if I don't hear what this one God gave me... Now, he's not even talking about these ears, is he? You can be completely deaf and hear, hear God. You don't need these ears to hear God. You hear inside there, right? We can all hear God. All we have to do is, sometimes we have to open up the door because we're the ones that shut it. Right? But he said, he who has an ear. This is repeated to every one of those seven churches. Remember I said that the seven churches actually represents the feast of unleavened bread. This is why through all seven of them, he says, repent. Repent, or he, has, he who has an ear, let him hear. He doesn't actually say repent to all seven of them. But the whole idea is to repent, to draw close to God. Repent. 